Duncan YMCA to become a kid, but in in those days that was a that was like a mixed atmosphere uh, where the uh, uh, you had to understand uh, things that uh, you, you know you uh, you didn't have to, to see on TV. And right right now you got guys kissing on TV, and I I have no no reason to judge anybody for those things. But in that time, I was I was uh, just learning. Of how to get along with others, so there, there was an experience there. But in that same place, when I came, I was in the Air Force, and I was uh, scheduled to go to Thule, Greenland, and I stopped off to visit the guys that I knew there at the time. And it was at that time they said, "Hey, guess what? Jesse Stonewall is is a, a member here, and he's in the Air Force, and he's going to Thule, Greenland." So that's how. I, I met him at the gym when he came in they introduced me to him and then we we became training partners uh, in Greenland I got to remember in Greenland it's a, a period of time during the year where it's 24 hours of sunshine and then there's, there's then there's a time of the year when it's 24 hours of dark and you have to adjust to that kind of proposition but the, the fun part of the, the, the whole thing is besides being 60 below zero, you have to wear these parkas. So when you came into the gym to work out, and at that time, Thule Greenland had the best gym in the Air Force. It was known for that. It was the, the uh, muscle beach of gyms in the Air Force. But in any event, uh, 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 Stonewall at the time, uh, had problems and he had to get uh, circumcised. So his his name was Flash because he would walk so slow because he had to walk in with with his parkas on and and he couldn't have any friction on his on his member and so his name was Flash. So later it became Rock. So I thought if to, if from a comedic and yet respectful means every man can understand this disposition. So with that, I'll turn it over to to Al. Yeah. What? Uh, explain to uh, the, the, <laughs> the peeps uh, who Al, who Rock uh, Stall actually was, because he predates a lot of the yeah, audience. Yeah, Rock was uh, a, he competed primarily in the Weeder competitions. You know, Mr. America, Mr. University, won Mr. Central USA, Mr. North America. I mean, every contest that was uh, that Weeder had, he had, he had entered, but. Yeah, you know, Stonewall was a piece of work because uh, what Bob didn't tell you was that Bob used to have uh, what was ultimately called Blair's Protein. Uh, we, were get, we were getting it from uh, the Ovaltine company, which was manufacturing it, and he was having it sent to Greenland, and uh, Stonewall would steal his protein. <laughs> And then he got the, when he got out of the Air Force. Borrow. He borrowed. Yeah, borrowed. Yeah, borrowed leave it at the yeah. window. So read it, read it, reimburse you later. <laughs> he got a job at Eaton's Health Food Store at 28 East Van Buren. I'm going to reimburse you, babes. Yeah. And uh, Stonewall uh, was known for for being an absolute thief because we go down there, we're 13, 14 years old. And he said, well, you know, he, oh, champ, you want to get big like me? And he'd flex his arms. And you'd be looking at his arms. You're 13 years old. Oh, my God, look at that. And, we wind up buying all sorts of crap, take it home, and every one of us had the same response. We get diarrhea. We go back and say, Rock, <laughs> Rock, this is not working, man. You know, I, I got sick when I, I, I took this stuff that you sold me. He said, well, champ, here's the problem. You, you weren't taking, and then you'd leave, you'd leave the store with another bag load of crap, and the same thing would happen. So, and one time a, guy, a father noticed that Rock was uh, uh, charging extra on the, on the bill, and so he took his kid downtown, confronted Rock and said, hey, you know, what the hell's going on here? He says, well, I, this is my nutritional consultation fee. And the, the, owner, the owner hired him and put him on salary, you know, to avoid that kind of crap. And he was also getting a commission from the Cal uh, uh, Supplement Company and a couple of other supplement companies. So he was hustling all the young guys, selling them this crap, and getting a commission from the supplement company and his nutritional consultation fee. And, and he, he sold the weeder stuff yeah, he sold out the of his trunk stuff. because yeah. it was <laughs> full of sugar, yeah. he told me. And uh, then he, he Stonewall himself would take Blair's protein. Right. And then he'd reach behind him and pull some stuff off the shelf behind a register and say, here's what you need. He didn't even know what he had in his hand. He said, here, just 
you know, I, I, Yeah, yeah, champ, yeah. yeah, everybody was Babe and Champ. I and mean, when I was working for him, when he when he owned the the uh, the Triumph Club, Club, I found out that he could never remember everybody's name. Now so he just called it Babe or Champ, and that yeah. was it. Yeah. Now you got to remember that the, the uh, real H. Blair was a name for Irvin Johnson, who was into astrology, right. and because of astrology, his astrologer told him that that name. Made based on the numerical factors wasn't right, so he had to change to Rio H. Blair. So we talked about uh, Blair protein, which was OptiPro, which was made by uh, Ovaltine. Ovaltine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ovaltine. And Blair died at what, 50? Just like Perry Rodale and all these other health proponents? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, Stonewall was uh, fired from his job at Eaton's because uh, he, the owner found out he was charging the nutritional uh, a consultation fee, and in addition to that, he was banging the owner's daughter. Hey, hey, language, Link. So All about the mob looking for him. <laughs> oh, yeah. beep, 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 beep. I was managing the gym for him, and, and uh, Rock was running his own prostitution ring. And these two guys came to the gym uh, before we opened, and these were the two as big, the biggest Italian guys I've ever seen in my life. And they wanted to know, hey, where's Rock? I said, well, he's not here right now. I said, when will he be here? I don't know. He makes his own hours. He's the owner. He says, we know that. Do you mind if we wait? So well, no, I don't mind at all. I'm, I'm 18 years old. So we march him over to the lounge, which is a ripped up couch and, a, <laughs> and a, 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 an old Sears silver tone t black and white TV with a coat hanger for an antenna. They sat there for three straight days wait, waiting for Rock to show up. Rock never showed. He calls me up. He says, babe. I said, Rock. Don't babe me, don't chant me, I've got two shaved gorillas waiting in the gym for you for three days. What is going on? I already knew what was going on. I grew up on the west side. And he says, well champ, i got to go underground for a while. You take care of the gym, Do you know, Dottie will be in charge, which was his ex-wife. That was a smart move, give your ex-wife power of attorney over the gym. She sold the gym to two meatballs for $500, and they moved it out of the loop. Yeah, out of Google. That was the best gym I ever worked out in, by the way. It was designed and equipped by Urban Johnson. So Rock then makes his run for New York, and he, and he starts to work with Leroy Colbert. He was married to Leroy's sister. So they, they catch up with him in New York, and then they chase him all the way to California. He gets a job with Jack LaLanne. Jack LaLanne lets him live in his compound, so he's safe. He starts training at Bill Pearl's gym. Then Rock who had a gift of gab like nobody you've ever met, talks Jack LaLanne into getting a, 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 a what do you call it, a, a loan on a 1971 Eldorado convertible. So Rock was going back into business. The outfit, uh, he, so Jack LaLanne co-signs on the loan, and the outfit lets Rock know they caught up with him by torching the Eldorado. Wow. Jack LaLanne gets stuck for the balance of the loan. Then we found that out because Jack O'Leary was in Chicago uh, pushing his My Fair Lady salons. We went to see him and you know, I said, Jack, how you doing? I understand Rock's working for you now. He leaps from the chair. He says, where is that son of a bitch? And then he tells us what happened. I says, I have no idea where he's at. So then Rock winds up going from California to Madison, Wisconsin, sets up a ring with the, uh, uh, the college girls in Madison. They catch up with him there. They chase him back to Chicago. And he starts dealing dope uh, in Rogers Park in Chicago. And he's standing on the corner uh, with Sergio Oliva. Sergio was a police officer in the 24th District in Chicago. And lo and behold, about 10 police cars come flying up on the corner. Guns drawn, orders Stonewall to the ground. Sergio's standing there not knowing what the hell is going on. And th Sergio told me the story himself. And he says, I had no idea Rock was wanted. Now, Sergio was a foot guy, so he never went to roll call. And they had Rock's picture on the wall saying, if you, if you see this guy, arrest his ass. So Sergio, they put Sergio in a squad car, take him to the police station. And in the meantime, the lieutenant is screaming at Sergio, what the hell is wrong with you? We've been looking for this guy for months, and your ass is on the corner talking to him? What's wrong with you? Sergio was dumbfounded, so he had to write a report saying, you know, what his relationship was with Stonewall. And Stonewall went to prison after that, and I understand after he got out, he went back to uh, Pennsylvania where he died 
of uh, a stroke. So that was kind of that was the saga of Rock Stonewall. He ended up in a wheelchair. Yeah, he was in a wheelchair for quite a while. But you know, you, you had to love the guy. I mean, the, it, no matter how big a thief he was, and uh, you know, he's. Uh, I I personally saw him do forty chins. 40, in a row. In a row. In a row. Yeah. Wide grip. Wide grip chins. Uh, uh, an unbelievable back, one of the best back I've ever seen. This is before before drugs. This is Thule Greenland. There was, nobody knew nothing about drugs at that time. This different story than nowadays. When we get in, we get into the era of Sergio and, the, and to follow the lead of Al, whose memory is uh, tremendous. I have to I have to say wow. I, I, in fact, for the past three days I've had dreams every night of, of uh, recalling all of these things. It's kind of Reiterating this, but there, there, there was a uh, there was this feature article about the Duncan YMCA, and you got to remember where it was located. Okay, it was Monroe and Ashland was, was uh, where it was located, but Mon uh, Madison and, and Ashland was considered Skid Row. That was the next block. Okay, so that was considered Skid Row. So we're we're like a half a block north of Skid Row, literally, and. Uh, uh, unbeknownst uh, to me at the time, but uh, only to be uh, deliberated uh, in the Chicago Tribune, they had a picture of uh, me and some of the guys that were uh, in the in the in the, the athletic portion. We were winning competitions and stuff, and pictures of Sergio in that, and in in that they also mentioned that it was a, a hangout for the Mafia. And so Tony Barbarossa and Sal Maglio and all, all those guys, his name Sam Giancana. All, all of Sam Giancana, all had lockers there and they were members of the Duncan YMCA since they were kids. And that was their private executive club. And I used to go in there every day and I knew them all by their, by their names, but not their last names, nor did I know them as, again, I was naive in terms of the fact that here we have a mafia that's in that. So it was an interesting uh, uh, atmosphere at that time, but to be revealed in the, in the Tribune. So, the, of course, the YMCA had uh, problems with this. And so after a couple of years, we had nothing but success at the Duncan Y. I mean, people were coming from the suburbs, just filling the place. And, it, and the guy that was running the YMCA's came in one day and said to me personally, he says, Bob, we got to let you go. He said, you know, and we, we can't tolerate the hernia factory anymore. So in terms of respect for bodybuilding and weightlifting and all, we had powerlifting, we had uh, weightlifting, we had shows uh, going on. The place was a mecca, but the YMCA had to close it down, not because of the mafia, but because of the, uh, the hernia factory. So, well, the, if you take it from there, Al. Yeah, the Duncan Y was a very interesting place because <clears throat> Bob had created two gyms. Uh, one was one was in the first floor. He took a basketball court and turned it into a bodybuilding uh, mecca. And the basement was for powerlifting and Olympic lifting. And he had a gym down there that would rival any Russian, Bulgarian, or Romanian gym. I mean, it was phenomenal. And uh, one of the things that Bob did, which, which uh, he didn't mention, is that the the best equipment in the world for weightlifting came from Russia. The Russian weightlifting equipment was considered the Rolls Royce of, uh, of, of lifting equipment and uh, we had York barbells and Ivanko, uh, um, the, the Swedish one, uh, Eliko, we had Eliko bars, but the, uh, the Russian set was not allowed in the country because it was manufactured in the Soviet Union and you got to remember back in the 60s we had the Cold War was raging, so if you were caught with any product made in the Soviet Union, you get arrested. So Guider figured out a scheme to have the Russian Olympic set snuck in through Mexico and then uh, wired its way up to Chicago, which is where we wound up with a, with a Russian Olympic set for the guys. I mean, you got to remember the guys that were training. They had Phil Grapaldi, um, uh, Russ Nip, Karchut. Uh, Mike Karchut, the uh, Olympic team. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, Freddie Champions. Balls. I mean, we had uh, you know, some of the, the best lifters in in the world. Working and the out Duncan there. Y, if I could throw this in, was one of the few gyms where not only was smoking allowed, as I saw Bob <laughs> walking around with a Campbell's on cigarettes, yeah. but it was required to smoke. <laughs> 
Another thing, but, but the, the, ter Terry always points out it was the golden age yeah. for 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 the, all of this stuff before they got rid of the press uh, and they started dropping the weights and said rub, rubber rubber bumper plates and all this other stuff. Yeah. And we had a super well, so we dropped the press in '72, but previous to this, we considered the golden age because of Chicago. Iron or Chicago bodybuilding because in '48 was it Steve Reeves won 47. Mr. America '47 yeah. and then a resurgent in '64. I was at the contest at Lane Tech where Bill Cena won most muscular. Uh, Bob competed all all kinds of guys or Sergio, and then what happened? Oh, and then in '69 was the final. Last hurrah of Chicago Golden Age at DePaul University. You might remember that, John. I don't know. It was probably just when you were just getting started, 1969 at DePaul. But um, in any case, uh, where was I going with this? Uh, yeah, I, ca I came and I got the the best advice from Bob. He was always happy to help guys for free. And I went in when I was a teenager and I had contracted the dreaded iron fever. <laughs> of course, there was no no cure. And I said, Bob, what should I do for my triceps? And Bob helpfully replied, do tricep exercises. And, uh, that made sense. And that changed my life. I, you know, I turned, turned everything around and uh, became the sitting in my basement as I am today doing this Wayne's World podcast. Well, yeah, a quick story about the, the 69 Mr. America. This is when Arnold Schwarzenegger was sent by Weeder to Chicago to find out what exactly did Sergio do. I mean, how did he train? What did he eat? And uh, Weeder, and, and I had uh, dinner with Weeder in, in 2004, and he openly admitted, he says, I had to get rid of the Cuban rebel. He said, I wasn't making any money with this guy. He, he was driving me nuts. So he figured, you know, Schwarzenegger was going to be his boy and sent him to Chicago to find out. So Sir, uh, Arnold says to Sergio at the 69 Mr. America, he says, I want to train with you. Sergio said, fine. He said, I trained at the Duncan Wyatt's at 1515 West Monroe. Show up, we'll train. Schwarzenegger showed up and then Sergio promptly mopped the floor with him. There was no way in the world that Arnold could keep up with Sergio. I mean, in anything, benches, squats, chins, dips. I mean, Arnold openly admitted, he, you know, in the middle of the workout, he said, I'm done. Now, wow. he gets a whole... Now, what, what, kind of, what kind of workout, what kind of weight was Sergio using? Well, back then he was doing repetitions uh, with 500 in the bench, uh, wow. easily 500, five and a half in the squat. He was doing 315 with uh, a bent over rowing. Uh, the, the guy was, and every time he did a set, after a set, he would do either a set of chins or a set of dips. And that was his yeah. workout. He was just uh, non-stop. Don't but the Yahoo. Yeah. Let, me, let, let, me, let me interrupt with it. Go back to some comedy, all right? This, this is, I'm, I'm always reminded of this, and I, I enjoy telling this story. But Arnold Schwarzenegger is one of the smartest guys in the world. I mean, I competed against him in, uh, when I won Mr. Universe, okay? East Germany, City East States. Germany. So I know him from that. He couldn't speak a word of English, but then the next time uh, Leopold Merck was his his uh, translator, and the ne next time I met him, he was speaking rough English, and that was at the time uh, when he when he came to America. But as he progressed af after Sergio, uh, the so-called, got wiped out by his strength, you got to remember Oliva came as an Olympic lifter from Cuba. So he knew how, he had a wonderful snatch, but he had hypermobile elbows. So he was always suffering from elbow problems and couldn't work his triceps because they were they were tough. So he had to do real short movements. And same thing with the curl. So his his arms, although they got bigger and bigger and bigger as he got bigger, and there's plenty to be said about that. It was interesting when they started to compete against each other. Okay. Sergio was at 135, and I was, I was, I, I, excuse me, no, Sergio was at 235, and I, I visited him at the Duncan Y at the time, and I told him, I said, you look great, and he, I gave him some advice in terms of nutrients and stuff to, you know, watch his diet and all that, okay? Now, after I had talked to him, 
Arnold called him up and said, Sergio, I got to tell you, I'm going to wipe you away. I'm weighing 255. I'm bigger than you. And big is better. Sergio went on a, on a whipped cream diet or something, started eating donuts and shit. Excuse me, audience, but beep, beep. Uh, he started eating crap, went up to 255. Schwarzenegger came in at 215. I was there. He was cut. He was ripped. It's when cuts and rips came back. And the big size guys, Draper and those guys, never showed that. Uh, uh, that, that, that bigness again. They, they started getting muscular again for a while. So, so, but that was that was brilliant in terms of psyching another guy out to get him to bulk up. When all the bodybuilders knew at that time, the common knowledge, you after you bulked up, you trim down. Okay, and, and the problem with that was your skin would sometimes hang because you got too big. But the Randall, the Randall concept started with the eat as much as you can. Bruce Randall. Yeah, Bruce Randall. So there's the, the bodybuilding history is very interesting. Well, Sergio. Was, what year was that, by the way, when Arnold made 215? Did he serve him with that 69? I think so. I, you know what? I'm, I'm looking 1970. at 1970. Yeah. Well, yeah. 1970. Yeah. 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 Well, Sergio's dietary proclivities were legendary in, 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 in Chicago. Yeah. When he first came to this country, a little guy named Jim Alexander gave him a job at a meat packing plant. And okay. he was astounded at, at Sergio's development. So, and he was watching Sergio take a side of beef on each shoulder and march it up a ramp and put it in a truck. So he, he, he says, oh, this is nuts. I gotta find out what this guy eats to get this big. So he sneaks into the employee's uh, lunchroom and he sees Sergio dining on two bottles of Mountain Dew and two packets of Hostess Twinkies. Now, if you remember, you had you, you honored Sergio at one of your contests, and I picked him up. I, I picked him up at his house, and I'm, you know we're we're driving to your uh, uh, out to uh, Romeoville, and Sergio says, "I gotta get a snack." I said, "All right, where do you want to go?" He said, "Let me go to Walgreens." So we take him to Walgreens. He comes out. What does he come out with? Hostess Twinkies and Mountain Dew. Breakfast. Yeah, we're yeah. all laughing at him. He said, "What's so funny?" I said, "You." I said, "Your Mountain Dew and your Hostess Twinkies." And I told him the story about. Uh, Jim Alexander, you know, was sneaking into the lunchroom and he just shrugged his shoulder and started munching away. But that was it. I mean, his, his dietary, he had no, no I diet. Did. When I was working as a paramedic in Chicago, about two blocks from his uh, station, 24th I, District, yeah. I would walk into McDonald's and uh, get some coffee or something. He would be in there. But this is one time I could talk of specifically. And he was sitting there in his uniform. He was, looked like King Kong. And he's chowing down, he had two big trays of McDonald's, big breakfast with all the greasy everything. <laughs> and I say, hey, morning, Sergio. And he says, yeah, I gotta eat. I gotta get big. And he's chowing down. Meanwhile, the other body, with Frank Zane's, weighing out his dietary supplements and his oatmeal with a jeweler scale and an eye loop looking for calories. <laughs> so that's the Sergio story. <clears throat> We had a lot of fun back then with that. He was, yeah, he was also. He ran him out of the gym. Yeah, he ran him out of the gym. He was saying, in, in order to be part of Rock Stable, you had to work out and be in shape. And we had, to, we had to. Yeah, one of his girls. Yeah, the, the, that's what he called me, Stable. And we had to, we had to cordon off the. Uh, the locker room because when the girls came to work out uh, and they wanted to take a shower and dress, you know, the other guys couldn't do it. And that kind of raised the stink because it was an all-man's gym and they didn't particularly go for that. So that was that was the beginning of the about end. about the nuns? Oh, God, no, that was with Ralph. But, uh, no, Rock was, uh, uh, he used to have stag movie night on Friday. He would, he would go rent a projector and back then you had these 8 millimeter uh, porno movies and he would charge, now get this, this is 1969, he charged five bucks to, for the guys uh, to, to come in and, and bring their friends and he'd throw a sheet over the chinning bar and that's, that was our, uh, uh, the screen. No, he, he never missed a trick. Well, the 
problem Brock had is he was doing it downtown. Now, I think if he was doing it on the south side or the west side, they kind of leave him alone. But no, he had to do it in the loop, you know, with his, his prostitution ring. The problem with that is that the girls were kicking back their street tax to Gus Alex. Now, Gus Alex ran the loop for Tony Accardo, which was the mafia in Chicago. And he wanted to know where is Rock's share, and the girl said, you know, you, that's your responsibility and not ours. And that's when they started chasing him. And the, the street tax back then was 50%. So Rock always spent his money, and he didn't have the money to pay Gus Alex. And that was a big mistake, you know. Uh, back then, uh, they, usually, they usually beat you half to death. But when Rock's case, and I, I wound up, uh, uh, after I, I graduated college, I was uh, I had my own construction company. I did some work for Gus Alex, and I was sitting on the front porch of the building uh, that I worked on, and I said, "Look, I'm not wearing a wire. You're not wearing a wire, obviously." I said, "Now, why didn't you just get Stonewall, beat the piss out of him, and get it over with?" He says, "Kid, you got to understand." He says, "We couldn't let him get away with that." He said, "The fear of the beating is much worse than the beating itself." And they chased him all, I said, well, I mean, why did you take all that time going from New York to California back, you know, to, to Wisconsin, to Chicago? He says, we wanted to make sure he never had a moment's peace and he was always looking over his shoulder. Uh, and they, uh, he had a stroke. He had a, a number of strokes and the, the last one killed him. He's in his 50s. His early 50s, yeah, and he'd, uh, he spent, uh, oh God, I think he spent six to eight years in, in prison. You know, they really hammered him. Uh, you know, he, uh, he the, the slick act got old real quick with the Chicago police. Right, he got married to Leroy Colbert's sister. Right, and uh, they got a divorce, and uh, he, uh, he, he also had a side job. And, State Street in Chicago, where right now uh, rests the uh, Harold Washington Library, Rock used to do security work or bouncer work for the strip shows that were uh, on State Street. And I think that's where he met his second or third wife. So he was always into some kind of scamp activity. Sharp guy, though. Tell me a little bit about uh, some of Sergio's workouts and stuff, because I've also heard stories about how unbelievable. I always say that I always say that Sergio taught me Olympic weightlifting and I taught him bodybuilding. Okay, that's all I want to say about it. Okay, when the uh, the, the drugs and all the bigness and all the diet came out, I tried my best for years to influence his dietary procedures, and I was I was a nut from from Irvin Johnson or Rio Blair, always on nutrition. I could talk that stuff night and day, okay? But Olympic lifting became my favorite uh, thing to do. And I, I, I love it. I mean, I, have, I, was, I won a region championship. Uh, Terry's got photos of me pressing uh, 325 pounds. I like to know how many guys could do that, okay? And my snatch, my snatch was 280. Uh, my clean and jerk was 375. I cleaned 400, but I couldn't jerk it. I mean, that was it was like somebody that ran six fours and then tried to run another six. When that was on my shoulders and I came up, I was just matching Clyde Emmerich. That's all I I can remember at, at the time. But I loved that. But there was a time that was the time when when I w was able to beat Ralph Kleiner for Mr. Chicago was because I outpressed him and he was a strong guy. So strength and health, or health and strength, which was the name of the British version of it, well, both of those looked at that. But the idea of health being a factor is an important thing for bodybuilders that, that seems to be returning. I mean, now people accept, expect, uh, accept bodybuilding. In my time, the Catholic Church was ready to run me out for vanity and all the other sinful vices that you can be accused of because you looked in a mirror. But you want to do a good bodybuilding, you need a, you need to look in the mirror, not because you're uh, admiring yourself. It's because you can see where your form is, and so you have to be able to regulate form. So, so it has changed dramatically.
Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm happy about that. I'm saddened about the fact that, that now th there's no resources except for guys like you who can bring the health factor back and, and, and emphasize that and we can start getting strength back in, in terms of where it belongs. Now, you can do that because physical fitness took, took over. Nowadays, every plasma that you can, you can go, uh, you can see some yoga sign. There's all these yoga gurus out there, all of whom which have achieved samadhi and nirvana, and they can take your money. Uh, you can talk about Stonewall taking your money, but these guys are taking your money. <laughs> as, as, uh, uh, I, I went to University of Chicago to study religion, and they, they had some people there who would, would talk about Zen Buddhism and, and yoga and all this stuff, but in a much different manner. Uh, uh, and, and their, their books are, are available, but they say, Ponticelli's Sutras, they say, if the man has not achieved Nirvana and, and, and uh, Samadhi, and they're, 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 they followed a vegetarian diet, I never saw a, a vegetarian win Mr. America. I, that's a protein uh, diet. Uh, uh, there's a different thing. Uh, uh, you mentioned the uh, TV. I heard of the one of the local shows in Chicago because you lived in North. So I know back then the Mr. America got the AU Mr. America. They gave you points for how much for your sending stores, right? But they did that at all the shows. They did that at the local shows? Yes. You had to have athletic points. If you're going to compete in a physique yeah, contest, yeah. you were given points. If you were an Olympic lifter or a power lifter, or if it was a tie. You know, or, yeah, and it would also help break yeah. ties. But, uh, so when, when you're asking the, the question about how does Sergio train, that's how he trained then. Okay, I became separated from the, in, that environment and, the, and, and all of that because I was asked to leave, leave the YMCA, not by choice, but because uh, because of the, the like, wait, Al can talk about the mafia, but we also had the Chicago Police Department captains, and they're all, all, all part of it playing handball. And I used to play handball, and, and uh, racquetball was just starting at the time, so that that was a part of the environment. But that was the same time when you could put twenty uh, twenty bucks on the back of your driver's license, the cops pulled you over, and that was that's the way Chicago was working. It's different now. I mean, but the environment then, like that, my point is that now, you know, it's not a sin to develop your body, well, or pay attention to it, or overdevelop. It, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, I don't know, Terry, how to, how to say it. Well, there's a paradigm. Back in the days of John, Grimmick and Steve Reeves, you were going for physical culture, health, size. Now we're up to the day of Richard Rich Piana, who I enjoyed watching, by the way. He just goes so far over the top. And um, of course, when there was a drug, the, you know, and I'm not a saint, but there were no drugs in the 50s and 60s per se. There was some natural testosterone around, but you know, they, the champs were not a a product of that. In any event, then I got crazy with, a, oh, well, another factor is that you had the strong guys like Grimmick and the whole York model and uh, Chuck Sipes and so forth. Then you had branching off Larry Scott and the Pumpers. And they, those guys didn't care what they curled or what they benched. They you, we don't, didn't even know what they did because they were Pumpers. And I'm not castigating that, but it was a different emphasis. Uh, Branching off from John Gorgat and uh, oh any of the any of the real Marv Eater, Bruce Randall, and so forth. So, uh, but getting back, I know John, you asked about Sergio's training, and we wandered off. But uh, you know, I'll ask Bob. I'll pass this to Bob. But Sergio was famous for doing incomplete reps, you know, non-lockouts and so forth. And which York barbell said, no, that's terrible. You got to do each one. <laughs> Full movement. So, Bob, what just what do you got to say about seeing uh, Sergio did some uh, partial movements? Would you say? Yeah, he did. That, that's what I said before. That, uh, I got to repeat it. Uh, and and uh, he, he he got bigger. He got bigger by it. But but he he stopped doing the. the I I didn't see him doing the weight lifting anymore. You know, with those those poundages. Uh, I don't think he I, he became a pumper. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, a user of Dianabol. Yeah, you were, you were because he went to Weeder because AAU didn't, uh, you know, uh, 
had rules. We had Avery Brundage, and we had drug testing and stuff like that. So you you, uh, you had to watch it. So in terms of when you train with me, he did my PHA system with me because we were training partners. Okay, and I also did a, a, a Olympic lifting uh, as a part of that too. So we we we. Uh, Interchange those. Oh, what those Sergio factors. did out of the shower and his shower clocks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no oh, yeah, yeah. He did. He, did, uh, he, he was able to snatch uh, 240 with, uh, with shower clogs on. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Tremendous uh, snatch. Wonderful. Yeah. 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 Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful <laughs> athlete. Okay. But but also, but the, the whole point of it that in terms of his training and his diet, and, and he lived right across the street from the Duncan Y. Yeah. Uh, oh, really? And, and he took out, he took my job because the, the, the Spanish population demanded that. It, it was after they threw me out, he took over my job, and I. But, but we, we we remained friends all those years. But he was no longer under my influence. So I have to say I knew him in the early period. I knew Stonewall in the early period. What they became later is is a, a different story. Okay. So Al, uh, I don't know how. A verifiable 500 pound bench press is no, it is well. I well, Schwarzenegger they, you know, said that's what he was doing. Well, he couldn't keep up with it. Uh, all of us tend to exaggerate, that's why I say you got to look at the back of the magazine for the totals. When I give you my total, I can show you in the back of Strength and Health magazine, it's listed there. Yeah, that one first and place. So. John, you may remember. Uh, the interview with Arnold where they asked him who's the strongest bodybuilder you knew. And that was probably from a magazine in the early 70s or late, probably the early 70s. And he said, without a doubt, Franco Colombo is very strong, but Sergio is the strongest bodybuilder I ever met in an interview. And uh, that's obscure, that's a lost interview now, but he did say that. And coming from the Oak, it's quite high praise. Yeah. And this was after completing a full day's work, because right. nobody right. nobody had a sponsor in Chicago. It wasn't like your weed was paying you for, to, to work out and, and eat. And Sergio, had a beach. Yeah, Sergio had a, a a manual labor job, yeah. and and still was able to get a workout like that. It was just a, a genetic anomaly. It was beast. phenomenal. Yes, yeah. mode. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's for sissies. Yeah, I mean, that's where, at the old Triumph Health Club in 1968, when we had the riots uh, in, uh, you know, for the Democratic Convention, we were at 9 o'clock on a Friday night, and the uh, the guys were ready to shut the gym down, and all of a sudden it, there was something that came into the gym we'd never, never heard of before, and it was tear gas. So, really? yeah, oh. then, then we liked it. Hell, we <laughs> loved it. We worked out harder because we're not weenies. <laughs> yeah. So we had to shut all the windows and uh, jump into the shower to get the uh, the tear gas off of our skin. So, uh, but that was uh, that was Chicago in '68. Uh, it, it was a very interesting period to go uh, to live through. But there's one guy you touched on that we haven't we haven't hit yet. Is Ralph Kleiner. Ralph Kleiner was was our version of Steve Reeves in Chicago. I mean, the only word to use for Ralph is, is gorgeous. I mean, he's Hands, handsomest man. Uh, yeah, uh, movie uh, star. Movie star, gorgeous. Genetics from yeah. hell. Yeah, I mean, I, I, t I told you the other day we you, we watched Ralph do incline curls with seventy five pound dumbbells. You know, he had the mo he had the most uh, incredible arm strength and uh, he, he physique that was just amazing. And some of the stories that we we've told you is the one time when. Uh, when uh, the gym was on the fourth floor, we had a music uh, studio on the fifth floor, and these nuns get off the elevator and come storming into the gym. You know, our, our door was open. There's about five or six nuns in, in their habits, and they're looking around. And say, oh no, we're on the wrong floor. And Ralph just got through doing a set of chins, and he's standing there huffing and puffing, and his glistening. shorts and yeah, glistening. <laughs> and this one young nun just could not keep her eyes off of Ralph. She just kept looking at him. 
And you know, by this time, all the Lead nuns have already gone into the, the elevator. The mother superior comes rushing in. She grabs her by the arm and yanks her out. And even while she's being yanked out, she's still looking at Ralph. We never let Ralph forget that. And that was the end yeah. of her location. Yeah, I wonder what happened to that nun. Yeah. And we had another one. Yeah, we were standing. We were standing out in Van Buren uh, on a summer's afternoon, and here comes Ralph, you know, with his gorgeous self, walking towards the gym. And here's a girl walking west on Van Buren, in the opposite direction. Of Ralph, and she walks right into a lamp pole. She couldn't take her eyes off of Ralph. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, there are other stories that we have, but uh, I don't think in, in good company it's a good idea to. Can't say that on no, TV. Yeah. Yeah. No, plus his wife is still living, so. We're going to leave that one going. What was the, uh, now what was the gym that made the uh, L train? So the people in the L train could see him. That was Triumph. That was Irvin Johnson's old gym. Sergio was, uh, he started out at Triumph. And, uh, okay. and he would he would take a set of squat racks and he would set them in the window and he'd take a bench and, and then he'd take an Olympic bar and he would do press behind neck right at the window. So when the people were going by on the L, I mean, the, the L would turn at Wabash and go north. So it almost come to a stop as it was turning. And here's Sergio doing uh, press behind neck uh, so everyone can see him. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that was about 63, 64. And, uh, and he lived there around there in a place that was, do you remember the Blues Brothers apartment? Cooking hot dogs on a nail, that was Sergio. That was inspired by his place. Yeah, the, the, the Triumph Health Club was... 61-62, somewhere in there. Yeah, he, uh, uh, he just an uh, amazing athlete and uh, made so Well, we used to see him uh, at the at the meets. Uh, Bob used to uh, uh, run the the uh, Olympic weightlifting competitions and the physique contests, and Sergio would compete in the Olympic lifting. And then, after the Olympic lifting, he would compete in the physique contest. How many guys do that today? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, unfortunately, the uh, physique... Go the ahead. The first time I saw Sergio was in 1976, I think, at the AU Mr. Tri-State contest, and he was the guest closer. And after the, um, after he got done guest closing, he came out in a row, and he sat on a stool, and somebody gave him a microphone, he was answering questions from the audience. And some guy goes, hey, Sergio, do you use free weights or machines? No machines, just three ways, no machines. <laughs> it's true. I asked him if he used Diana Ball, and Sergio says, no, uh, Diana Ball, e shit. I said, okay, Sergio, I, you can bleep that out. <laughs> yeah. No, that would be bad anymore. Yeah, and you know, Oliva was, uh, it, it, what, what upset us is there weren't that many people at his funeral. Uh, you yeah. would think there would be a lot more, but uh, he was kind of let down by the Latin community and the bodybuilding community. There was very few people at his funeral. Yeah, I talked to Blair Cole recently, and he said, he said the same thing. You know, he really admired Sergio. And when they competed on a junior Mr. America together and stuff, and he said he didn't even know about Sergio's funeral until after it was over. And he uh, he was he was trying to get a hold of uh, Sergio Spiro, and he was trying to get a hold of Sergio's manager to pay for the headstone. Oh, wow. Yeah, a couple of months before Sergio died, Bill Pearl was in town and he wanted to see Sergio and he asked me, he said, well, you know, can you get a hold of Sergio so we can get together? I called him and called him and he wouldn't return my phone call. Finally, I went over to his house and I see him now. Uh, by now, he, he's like a little old man walking with a cane and, and he couldn't even get the key into the lock and I got out of the car and I walked over and I took the key and I opened the door and I said, no, you don't tell me why you didn't return my phone call. He says, I know what you want. He says, but, you know, you've got to tell the guys, I don't want anybody to see me look like this. And what I didn't know is that he, some thugs in the neighborhood jumped him uh, about a month or two before, beat him up. Yeah, beat that necklace. Yeah, and they took the all the gold necklace. that he used to have hanging off him. If you, if you remember, he used to have all that gold oh, yeah. you know, dripping off him. Yeah. yeah, they pounded him pretty good. And uh, in, in reality, he never really recovered from that beating. And uh, that was, and then soon after that, uh, that we found out that he had died. I think that's why all you see all these uh, Spanish uh, baseball players with the necklace now. Yeah, say it again, John. I think that you imagine if those punks would have tried that when Sergio was in his prime? Uh, it wouldn't have worked out very well. Well, 
Sergio had a, a, had a mean side to him that in 1967 in Humboldt Park, they, they, every June they have a, a Puerto Rican festival, and the Chicago, the Chicago police shot a Puerto Rican uh, at the festival, and uh, uh, there was a riot, and Sergio and his homies took a Chicago police squad car and flipped it into the Humboldt Park Lagoon. Right. Mario Nieves, Sergio, and a bunch of other guys uh, took the, uh, the squad car, threw it into the lagoon. That's a little tidbit that most people don't know about Sergio. Right. So it was, it was fun times. Yeah. Riots and all. <laughs> and you were saying uh, was a cop also, right? Sergio was a cop. Uh, he uh, got his job. The old-fashioned way in Chicago, he had juice, he had uh, uh, Commander Reardon wanted Sergio on the police force because of the burgeoning Latin community in Chicago. And in Chicago, Sergio was a god in the Latin community. I mean, he used to ride around in this Excalibur like he was a, you know, a king. You know, he had that little uh, fedora and usually a blonde next to him. And, and he, he was needed by the police department. And that's how he couldn't write a report. Sergio was essentially a functional illiterate. Somebody right. somebody always uh, wrote the reports for him. Yeah. Wow. Do you think you guys don't think Sergio was the greatest as he can hold Oh, without a doubt. There's nobody yeah. that could come. I mean, when you look at if you if you look at him at his peak, and you look at Schwarzenegger at his peak, there is no comparison. I mean, the guy had a 29-inch waist and 29-inch thighs and a 55-inch chest. Who has dimensions like that? Well, I'll chime, on, I'll chime in on this, too. Somebody in a magazine or a forum said that Arnold had the greatest competition physique, but Sergio had the best gym physique. You know, Arnold would be pre prepared to the last, you know, di maybe diuretics and uh, uh, dieting and everything, but Sergio didn't diet, he didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Sergio was always a monster. He wasn't a product of, you know, four months of dieting and then three months of bulk, you know, he was just always a monster. And uh, uh, something else came to mind about Sergio. Oh, well, this is something probably nobody knows, but there's a bodybuilding, good bodybuilder buddy of mine from the old days, and he managed Sergio's gym. Well, it was, a, it was not Sergio's in Chicago, but some couple guys wanted to open a gym. They said, we're going to call it Sergio's Gym on Ridge Avenue. <clears throat> Anyhow, this was during the comeback. And what was it, 83, 84, John? 84, 84, yeah. Yeah, so he went to the, he was... He was ripped to, you know, he was in tremendous shape, Oliva. And bef the people in the gym said, we're going to have a going away party with a big table. And uh, my buddy, in fact, you remember him, John, what's his name? Uh, uh, Mendez, uh, George Mendez, do you remember him? Well, he said, please don't do this, make this table because he's going to eat from one end to the other. And he did. <laughs> the night before he flew out, he... He said he was he was veiny before he, he got into the <laughs> the table and ended up at the contest like a jelly donut. He was all uh, water. Yeah. Now see that's the thing he would do. He wouldn't he wouldn't be no, you know like Zane button. where everything is just you know to the nth degree. He just and that was what made him great and the fact that he had a, he was always fully employed not laying on the beach and and some people say well that's the way bodybuilding competition is the best guy wins and i say well that is true there's rules and there's an expected conditioning appearance and so forth but if you're just talking about a, uh, a an unbelievable man human being weight room monster that was Sergio. Yeah. Ironically, he did not want Sergio Jr. to go into bodybuilding because he knew it was a swamp of drugs and politics and 
no, really no financial gain. You probably spend more money as an IFBB pro than you earn, and you and I have talked about this many times. Your net uh, winnings are, you know, after a year, are minus something usually, unless you're, Jay, yeah, unless you're Jay Cutler or one in a trillion people. But um, uh, so I, I hope that uh, Sergio Jr. You know, really gets his priorities right because um, you know Sergio died. We were all at his funeral and at the cemetery. And I remember standing there. We were there for quite a long time talking. His ex-wife Arlene was there and so forth. And who who was the fellow from um, the editor? Muscle and fitness. Uh, fitness. Yeah, oh. he passed away. Sean. Sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And he what a what a good guy that was. But anyhow, I remember we were at you know, last people there, and they just filled in the hole. I, I can send you some pictures. I took pictures, uh, and I've posted them where there's just at Sergio's grave life gravesite. Everybody has pretty much gone, and there's a mountain of just dirt, you know, where he had filled it in by hand, and it was sobering. You go, oh my God. And yet, on the other hand, you got Arnold, who's still vital at basically the same age or a few Sergio. years younger. I just wanted to say that about that. Yeah. Here's something we learned at the, uh, uh, at the funeral mass. Sergio attended mass, Catholic mass, every single Sunday and sat in the same wow. pew every single Sunday. And the story that Joe Weider told me when, uh, when Sergio first won the Mr. Olympia contest, they wanted uh, Oliva to advertise Weider products. So they had a four pound container of protein that they handed Sergio at the uh, Jimmy Caruso uh, uh, a picture taking session af you know, after the contest. And uh, Sergio says, what's this? And Joe Weider says, well, you know, Sergio, you, you won Mr. Olympia, you're gonna be advertising Weider products all over the world. We're gonna send you all over the world and you know, you're gonna be uh, well known and so will Weider products. And Sergio looks at him and says, he says, I don't take this shit. <laughs> Oops. <clears throat> and we just said, well, uh, that's fine, but uh, we need this for advertising so you can uh, promote Weider products. And Sergio handed him the, the container back and said, that's dishonest. I'm not going to do that. And that's when Weider decided he had to get rid of Oliva. He says, I, was, I wasn't making any money off of the Cuban rubble, so he had to go. And that was it. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, uh, I want to thank you all for joining me for this, uh, these reflections of the past, especially with Chicago. And we'll, hopefully, we'll have to get down again and talk about some of the older stories again. So, uh, thank you, Al, Al Yakich, and Jerry Strand at 1966, Mr. America, Bob Guida. I appreciate you guys all coming out to uh, talk about the old days. Thanks for having us. Thank keep, you. All right. Keep doing your work to bring the health back into and, and bodybuilding back. I, we're, we're here. All right, Bob. I'm right. working with Lance Dreher. Talk to Lance, too. He's, he's got a whole program about PHA and all that coming out for you, buddy. Okay. All right. All right. Bye-bye, John. Thank you, John. Take care. All right. All right. Take care. All right. You, too. That was fun. That was great. I had that Dave Draper quote, too, that said he never made a dime off of Weaver. Off of oh, yeah. No, I mean, we got to go. Well, you know, Scott made money off of Weaver, he, but it, that was a different, you know, he was smart enough to advertise. You know, he got the page of advertising. Well, he got it for free. So I just said.